Okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the short little main slate we've got uh, on the docket today for Thursday, uh, April 13. Just a five-gamer. Um, we do have a, a short two-game as well, starting uh, short two-game early slate, that is. Um, come over to the lab's free lineup page. Um, short two gamers starting at uh, 1 Eastern, uh, Oakland and Baltimore and Boston, trying to stop Tampa from winning every single game they play. Um, not going to go over this in, in detail, but uh, you're going to have to, well, number one, you're going to play Jeff Springs. I, there's too much opportunity cost. Uh, we do have projections and everything loaded to the site for the short little two gamer so far. Um, so we will have um, we'll have numbers there for you guys uh, if you are punting. You could get a little bit different here. Um, you're definitely going to want to like <laughs> attack Adam Aller in some fashion. He just gives up way too much contact um, and a lot of power, no strikeouts. So that's why you're seeing such a, a, a very high implied run total for the O's so far. Um, now you're also kind of seeing it on on Tampa over here against Kluber. Um, I think this is one of the ways that you could pivot today. Irvin and Springs are going to be, you know, mostly the the pitching chalk. Um, but on a four gamer, certainly on DK, you're not going to be able to to get different with your, your pitchers. So unless you play Adam Aller, which I do not suggest. But uh, the opportunity cost for fading Jeff Springs, that's how you could get different. Uh, if you want to play Urban and Kluber, I mean, okay. But um, the opportunity cost of fading a guy that's going to be well over 85% owned in almost everything, um, it's very, very high. And as a matter of fact, Jeff Springs has a pretty significant reverse split. Um He's very good against righties, and he gives up most of his power to lefties. So if you want to get different, you play a power lefty, in particular uh, Rafi Devers. Um, we're not going to get Yoshida today for the Sox. He came out with like a Tammy or something. Not sure if they put him on the DL, um, but he did uh, get scratched either yesterday or the day before. So he might not even be in the lineup. So that's a, something that you can um, probably cross off your list. Verdugo, really the only other decent lefty uh, that they have, but 4,600, I don't really want to go after Springs. He doesn't really have a whole lot of pop anyway. Uh, but that's how you could get different. You're going to have to do it with your hitters mostly and and not your arms. But it's going to be some combination of the, the these three guys over here. Um and then you can play pretty much whoever you want. Obviously, this is a two-game slate. You can do whatever you want um, and and play pretty much anybody. you get, you got to embrace variance on, on very short slates like this. So um, just play Springs, and then after that, just kind of click buttons, I suppose. Uh, but we do have projections up if you, uh, if you need to check out a little bit of a guide. Ownership, very, very important on short slates like this. If you can find a an equitable spot, uh, perhaps from some of these Oakland guys over here, or uh, maybe a, a lesser owned um, you know, Baltimore piece down here at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, Santander, he, he may not even play today. Uh, it is a day game, and they've been trying to give him, uh, he's pretty cold to start the season. Um, despite having a pretty good classic. And he may actually have tweaked something. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was um, off the top of my head. but uh, he So he might not even be in the lineup today, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, or fortunate with it being just a two-gamer. At 4,400, he'd probably be like freaking 55% owned. Um, but that's your main shock. It's definitely Baltimore. So you're going to have to figure out how to get different somewhere, somehow. Um, I don't really want to go after Jeff Springs, but like I said, he's got a reverse split, so that's something that you could consider. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, get different with it and, and pay attention to the projections. We'll have updates as we come into lock-in uh, and lineups roll out. So, um, you know, use it as a, those as a guide, but uh, embrace the variance on, on two-game slates because they're very um, – they're very variant, so to speak. Um, all right, so here's the main. Let's get into it. You got Philly and Cincinnati. Bailey Falter and Nick Lodolo on the mound. Uh, Lodolo going to be your chalk here in the early runs as well. We have pushed these to the site also. Um, seeing 45 50%. Probably it seems pretty okay here. Uh, Lodolo far and away the best K stuff um, on the slate here. And getting him in half your teams seems uh, pretty respectable. Um, honestly seems a, a tick low, to be quite honest. But, you know, not a great matchup, of course, against Philly um, in aggregate. So we'll we'll see what the line, what they want to do with the lineups. But, um, you know, he's, he's definitely the highest upside arm in, in just raw strikeout stuff here today, even against Philly. Um, on the other side, Bailey Falter really kind of limits hard contact, but uh, still... Gives up some stuff over the wall, so you get to an off-the-board Cincy if you'd like. Um, Minnesota and the Yankees. Brito, it looks like, is, is getting his third start through the rotation. He's been good in his first couple. Uh, gone five innings each. And the Yankees get Joe Ryan on the other side. Fly ball pitcher at Yankee Stadium. Um, so we'll get into the numbers there and, and see if we can uncover some value. Detroit and Toronto. Turnbull on the mound for Detroit in his third outing now. Uh, was markedly better. He actually went like five and two thirds, I think, in his in his last start. Uh, he still gave up a bunch of runs and still had a negative DFS score. So there's that. Um, it gets another terrible matchup once again today in Toronto. Chris Bassett on the other side uh, gets Detroit probably going to lead the way in value for you as the Sheets value score coming in uh, at, as the currently highest number on the day. So a pretty good option, I think, there to target him at a decent price tag, 8,200 over here. Um, Pittsburgh and St. Louis. St. Louis probably going to be chalk again going after Vince, Gal Vince Velasquez. Gives up a lot of power really to both sides of the plate. Um, Montgomery, also relatively popular here in the early runs. Uh, pretty good play against an overall kind of weak lineup. But um, definitely the... the downside of his split is two righties. He will give up far more contact and the, and the strikeout stuff not nearly as potent against the right side of the plate. So you could get to a really off-the-board Pittsburgh stack if, as well if you'd like. And it looks like we're going to have Bryce Wilson on the mound for Milwaukee. Probably just going to be a bullpen day for them. Um, a couple of sites across the industry, Fangraphs, DK, like all these guys have uh, Bryce Wilson projected MLB hasn't announced it uh, for sure, so um, there's still a little bit of ambiguity here. But uh, Padres will get him. Um, he gives up a little bit of power as well. We'll get into the numbers. And Milwaukee on the other side might see some ownership on, on Milwaukee today. They're still cheap, and they get Nick Martinez, who's probably not going to blow it by them all too often. So that said, um, here's the initial runs, of course, in ownership and Fantasy point projections, so keep an eye out for these. They're they're up, and we'll uh, we'll have updates for these throughout the day as well. And you know, we'll see how these how these numbers start to flesh out. So let's just uh, let's get into it. Uh, we'll go a little bit deeper today um, than we did yesterday. So we've got a little bit more time, and I believe we fixed the audio problems. Um, so, Falter on the mound for the Phillies. This is a decent price here at 7000 We saw that the Reds kind of got to Spencer Strider a little bit last night. Gave up a couple in the first inning because he was pitching to a little bit too much contact. Um, and we mentioned that with Strider. That's, he can just pipe the fastball occasionally. And you know, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how hard you're throwing or what kind of strikeout stuff you've got. He's similar to DeGrom in this regard in that, you know, if you just throw the fastball right over the middle of the plate, guys are – Everybody in the big leagues can hit 95, 98. Um, so, nevertheless, the Reds could be a little bit sticky here against Bailey Falter. Um, he's 7,000 and a 10% ownership. I think it's fine tournament play. We only have, whatever, five or six games on the on the slate here. And I already forgot how many. Let's, let's count. 
uh, five games. Um, so you you could play him. Uh, it, it's perfectly fine. As I mentioned, he he limits hard contact certainly to the left side. Shorter sample here, just 21, uh, 21 innings and only you know 80 hitters faced, give or take, in the last season or so. But uh, but good suppression numbers, certainly to same-handed hitters. Um, where he's a little bit vulnerable is to righties. 274 average allowed, 349 WOBA, and a 217 ISO with a 20% K rate to the right side. Now, he's not going to walk anybody, so he's not going to put people on base for free because he throws strikes, 66% strike one rate. Um, but the barrel rate, slightly elevated, definitely not the highest of everybody on the on the short five gamer tonight but uh pushing nine percent on really any slate is, is definitely attackable he's a fly ball pitcher and this is a great american um we haven't checked the weather it looks like pretty calm but relatively re relatively warm um in cincinnati tonight so ball could still fly it's a small small field right so the hard contact, he's still not over 30%, which we'd like to uh, see when we're attacking these these types of batted ball numbers. But it still translates into a 1.8 homers per nine. And in a small ballpark, that's not going to fare all that well all too regularly. So you could get to some of the reds here. They have plenty of pop. Their pricing um, is has been really variant over the last week or so. Tyler Stevenson has volleyed from 47 down to 4,000, back to 47. Now he's 42 again today. So really all over the place. Will Meyer's still cheap because Will Meyer still can't hit. Uh, Spencer Steer, they've had him in the two-hole uh, against lefties. You can get to him for sure at 3,000. He'll be pretty popular, I think, today, uh, but pretty good value-adjusted play. Um, Kevin Newman, he is a contact hitter. Some pop, 3,700. He is just kind of a, a middling shortstop play for you. Um, and on a short slate, as we kind of talked about with the early one, it, ownership's still pretty important. So if you want to get to a, a full red stack and play some chalk arms like a Bassett, um, you know, a Bassett and you know, whatever, Jordan Montgomery, it's fine. Um, if you want to play Bassett and Lodolo, correlate with the reds, fine as well. Uh, you know, you can do a lot of different stuff here. Um, but if you also want to attack with Bailey Falter and play some Phillies and stack against Lodolo, I mean, certainly not the, the most probable outcome here that Lodolo gets blown up, but um, a little susceptible. His hard contact to righties is over 30%, and that's what we do like to see. However, he's got a 29% strikeout rate compared to Falter's 19% strikeout rate against right, the right side. So... Um, far less vulnerable in terms of just raw contact is Lodolo than Falter. So uh, he'll get on the barrel as well at a full 9%. So it, it's not totally unheard of that, um, you know, he gives up a little bit of power. I mean, we've, we've certainly seen that before. He can get popped and, and give him some balls in the air. And Now, Bryce and Stott's not, certainly not going to lead off. This is her lineup from yesterday. But you'll have Trey back at the top. Um, Castellano still at a cheap price, 4300 for him. You can get to some of the Phillies if you want to hedge off of some heavy Lodolo exposure if you decide to go that route. Uh, Alec Bohm still a pretty good price. He'll be probably in the f five or so. Um, at 4100 he's got first and third eligibility now that they're trying to move him over and platoon him a little bit and get him some reps over at first. Um Platoon him with Cody Clemens, that is. Uh, he will unlikely, or he is unlikely to be in the lineup today, um, as is, you know, Jake Cave. So they're, they're going to probably try and get to their righty-heavy lineup. Um, no matter, you don't really want to be full stacking against Lodolo. Um, if you're trying to win a tournament, I mean, it's definitely something that could, that could win you a tournament. But uh, very low probability outcome. Uh, he's definitely the chalk arm, and like I mentioned, in half of your teams, it's you almost definitely want to get to wherever the field is, and probably want to get over. He's just got the you know, far and away the the best case stuff. Um, and even against Philly in the early going here, short sample, 180, 170 PAs against lefties this year, they're striking out at a 25% clip. So uh, they're still attackable. 
and you know like Trey and Schwarber and and um, Castellanos, for example, like some of the, these guys will strike out a little bit. Definitely some of their younger, less uh, adept hitters at the big league level uh, will whiff also. And Lodolo certainly has the highest upside of anybody on the day. So um, we can get to some Reds. You could get to Lodolo, and on five short five game slate, you could play both Bailey Falter and some Phillies if you want to. All right. Uh, Minnesota and the Yankees. Joe Ryan on the mound for the Twins, and Joe Ryan's been good. He has, similar to Pablo, also brought in the sweeper a little bit, try and neutralize power to same-handed hitters. Um, historically has had a little bit of an issue there, but he's a fly ball pitch, heavy fly ball pitcher, so he doesn't give up a whole hell of a lot in terms of you know homers per nine, for example. Like, ball's not necessarily going over the wall, but he, he does give up, you know, some extra base hits, and that's a 190 ISO to righty. So he has brought in the sweeper to try and neutralize that vulnerability a little bit. Still a good fastball, and we'll we'll need quite a bit more data. Uh, I actually got to get it in the sheet here um, on the sweeper and to, to see how the arsenals of guys like he and Pablo Lopez in particular for the Twins have changed. So... Um, I think Joe is a good option today at, at 20% in early runs here. Median projection about 15. Seems seems fine. Um, 8,800 with that median projection, perhaps a little bit stiff. Uh, we don't like playing fly ball pitchers at Yankee Stadium, certainly. And I think this is a, a reasonable spot to even try and get to some less popular Yankees. You're going to see... Some heavier ownership on, on like Toronto, St. Louis, of course. And the Yankees here with, uh, they're, they're a little bit banged up, but, um, and have been overall power wise pretty disappointing here in the early going. Um, but you can still get to some of the Yankees here. I think, you know, Joe Ryan's definitely got the, probably the, the second best raw strikeout stuff on the, on the day here. So you can play both sides here, I think, but, uh, as a, Pure flyball pitcher, um, that might be a little bit overpriced in in general for this particular matchup in this stadium. Um, I think you can you can both play him and you could take shots against him. Uh, certainly, you can play Judge every single day. He's going to be popular, definitely. Um, but on a five game slate, really at twenty percent ownership, at least um, in early runs here. <laughs> it's probably a pretty decent number, to be quite honest. And if you want to, I mean, it, in most slates with Judge, you're going to see probably 30 to 40 percent ownership on 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 him on, on five gamers. That is. So, um, if you want to even reduce that ownership a little bit, you can get to some of the rest of the Yankees. Here's their pricing. Um, Stanton is attainable at 51. Rizzo at 47. Less crazy about this. Um, as he is a fly ball hitter, and we don't generally want to attack with fly ball hitters against fly ball pitchers. Um, but it's it's perfectly fine. He doesn't strike out. He's going to make a lot of contact in general. And Joe Ryan, while he does have strikeout stuff, um, it's a markedly lower strikeout rate against the left side of the plate. So uh, Rizzo still at even a slightly elevated price tag for him. Uh, 47 is not terrible or anything like that. Franchi Cordero, really good price here. He's had a fantastic start to the year. Um, you can get to him. He's 2,800, and he's got dual eligibility here. So we'll see what the Yankees want to do. Um, Glaber dealing with a little bit, uh, as is DJ. Um, kind of feeling that they've tweaked some things here in the last couple of days. Uh, I think it's mostly muscle strain, so I'm not, not sure what's going on with the Yankees over here, but uh, they need to do some stretching, I think. Um, like, for example, Donaldson just went on the DL with a pulled hammy or whatever it was. So um, maybe maybe pay attention to the pregame for, for the Yankees, and if all of them are actually out on the field stretching, then, then maybe you can play them. Uh, stay off otherwise? I don't know. I'm kidding. But you, you can get to the Yankees, even though you have to pay for Judge and Stanton and a little bit for Rizzo, the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, uh, you can you can certainly play as well. Anthony Volpe, they had him leading off. Not sure if they're going to do the same against righties. 
we'll see. Um, but with DJ, if he's taking a seat, they'll probably just stick up, stick Volpe up at the top of the lineup and, and let him go. So um, early runs in the Yankees, probably a middling type of stack, but uh, five games late, you can do whatever you want. Uh, on the other side, you have Johnny Brito. We talked about him briefly. Two good starts so far, five innings in each. Uh, problem throwing strikes, though. Strike one is a, a pretty big worry here. Very low number at 51%, 52%. Uh, hasn't totally translated into raw walk rate yet because he's got some workable secondary stuff. Throwing the slider at about 15%, give or take, relying heavily on the changeup so far, and it's actually in the early going his most used pitch. So, um, and naturally, I mean, he's seen, what, 26 hitters to about two and a half times more hitters from the left side as he has righties so far. So uh, very, very short sample here. So not a lot we can take out of the, the arsenal um, in terms of value or anything like that. It's going to be very noisy on the on the sinker. Um, six and a half value score on the sinker and a four and a half on the, on the change. Like these are super noisy so far. But as far as usage goes, we can take a little bit more out of that. And certainly the strike one rate, as we've talked about before, um, Every single hitter, you'll get, you'll get a, a data point here for the strike one rate, and um, you know, seeing just whatever how many hitters this is, 37 hitters, he's only thrown 50% strike one. I mean, that's that's concerning. Does have 12% swinging strikes and a kind of concerning low call strike rate at a at, at this moment, you know, 27% CSW. So we'll need to see this stuff normalize little bit but this is an okay matchup for him probably going to see about five innings out of johnny once more and it's a decent matchup um against the twins here they're mostly right-handed heavy they've only got a couple of guys that they're going to bring in from the left side notably uh, trevor larnick they'll probably have him up at the top of the lineup in a three hole maybe um unlikely to be nick gordon I mean, they're just moving him all over the place trying to get him going but uh, <laughs> it's been kind of a, a tough slog so far for Nick Gordon uh, in the early part of his career. Trevor Larnick, though, um, best hitter from the left side at the moment in the Twins list. They did just bring up Edouard Julian um, from Quebec. He played for Canada in the Classic. And big hit tool here for Julian. And he is the stone minute second base. Um, probably going to lack... A little bit in the defensive categories but uh this kid can rake so um if you need a cheap piece and you want to go after another young arm over here and johnny breed on a short slate and you're getting to like a larna julian and maybe a buxton or something um if he plays i mean i don't like this price tag in this in this matchup necessarily for buxton but uh I mean, it's playable. You can play him on it's five games late. You can play him for sure. And he's sub 10% on it at the moment. Um, so you can get to some twins. They're another off the board stack if you'd like to attack that way. Julian may be in the bottom third of the lineup, which is unfortunate, but we'll see what they do. Uh, they may want to play the plus side of his platoon slit. A lot of power from him and a pretty damn good hitter. So um, he's going to be one of these guys they're going to want to give a look since they don't have all that much from the left side of the plate, the Twins. So he'll uh, hopefully provide a little bit of platoon value um, against uh, against right-handers. So uh, at 7,700, you can play Johnny Brito for sure. The In the early going here against righties, Twins about 380 PAs, 25% strikeout rate, and sub-300 Woba, buck-12 ISO uh, in aggregate as a team. So not creating at uh, just an 86% or an 86 WRC plus rather. So struggling out of the gate here for the twins. And for the most part, this is probably where they're going to end up going to be overall as we get into the summer, things will, will get a little bit better for them, but uh, overall pretty weak lineup. Um, we'll see when they get some of their guys back healthy, notably Max Kepler and, uh, somebody else that's hurt. <laughs> Name is escaping me. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be you know, a, a pretty kind of menial offense, I think. Some upsides, some good hitters, Josie Miranda, Buxton, obviously. 
um, and definitely Trevor Larnick. Ryan Jeffers has some pop. He got into uh, a decent score yesterday. I think Luck boxed his way into a triple, but um, you know, nevertheless, some pop from these guys, but overall pretty m marginal uh, power and and upside. So you can play some Johnny Brito if you'd like, and and play him with a little bit of the Yankees. Okay, Detroit and Toronto. On to basically chalk everywhere here. Chris Bassett on the mound for the Jays. Turnbull for the Tigers. 58 for Turnbull. I don't think you can touch this yet. He just looks really, really uncomfortable on the mound. The mechanics look really off. Um, like I said, he was definitely better in his last... At least he went deeper. He still gave up five runs. But um, no strikeout stuff here so far. And we need more of a sample from Turnbull coming off of TJ to really get confident playing him uh certainly against against lineups like the like the Blue Jays here. Um now they underperformed in terms of DFS scores yesterday. Still won the baseball game though, so I don't think they really care. Um so I don't think Turnbull is even like really in any remote consideration here today uh like if you script and you land on, you know, a 5,800 Turnbull and a couple of teams, I, I, good luck. But um, pretty unlikely that you're going to see a serviceable number at a Turnbull. Like, he could pop for 12 or something like that. But um, with a couple of these other arms, like Lodolo and a Bassett in particular, in in fine matchups, L Lodolo obviously was a lot of upside. Jordan Montgomery with some upside, et cetera, et cetera. You're probably going to need a good 20 or so from your starting pitchers today um, to compete in tournaments, I would I would assume. And I'd say that's probably a, a pretty unlikely and, and maybe an edge case outcome for Turnbull in this particular matchup. They're just not going to strike out. And he hasn't been able to throw it by anybody just yet. Still having a little bit of trouble throwing strike one. Better number... At, at 57 and a half percent, but we need to see this over 60 before we start getting comf comfortable playing guys against Blue Jays. And walk rate is worrisome. Short sample, definitely still in you know just 40 hitters, but um, you know not throwing it past anybody and giving up some power so far. And it's had some pretty bad matchups, admittedly. I think he got what Tampa, Boston, and, and now he gets Toronto. So um, really struggling out of the gate, and he probably should. So this is kind of expected. I wouldn't really want to uh, to get to him. But he's 5,800, and it's five-game slate. If you need to get super contrarian because you're playing a very chalk stack, like uh, St. Louis, for example, he is an option, and he could survive for 10 or 12 points. Um, but a pretty low probability outcome, I, I would say. Uh, so that, that means we want to get to Toronto. They're going to be very popular today, definitely. And here we go. In the early slate, got lineups starting to roll in. Um, Springer, Bichette, Vladdy. Of course, you can play these guys pretty much all the time. Bo Bichette, 5,800. This is very elevated price tag for him in general. Um, he's a fine hitter, but he a lot of the upside for him is priced out at this number. Vladdy, not necessarily, but also a pretty expensive price tag. Springer, of the top three here, is certainly the, the, the most well-priced, I would say. Varsho, of course, still attainable at 41. Pretty good spot for him today. Uh, Matt Chapman has he continues to hit very, very well in the early couple of weeks here of the season. Uh, 5,000 is price tag starting to respond a little bit. So not crazy about this now, but seeing the baseball really, really well. And um, I don't care who you talk to, hot streaks exist in statistics and in numbers over markedly large samples they they really don't but in short samples they absolutely do and um well we're playing the short sample daily game here in dfs so uh, you can jump on board hot hitters when they're seeing the baseball well even at um at prices that you would not prefer to pay on a more regular basis uh and i think matt chapman qualifies in that regard here ali kirk number popping a little bit on him as well probably see some danny jansen uh today but we'll see what they want to do with the list. Brandon Belt, very attainable, 2,500. So you can get to the Jays for sure, and you can get contrarian with them. Um, Kevin Biggio might be a little bit popular, popular if you're building a lot of teams. 
because he's cheap, but he kind of stinks. Um, he has retooled the swing a little bit, so he's not relying as heavily as in the past couple of seasons on the fly balls, trying to just jack it up to the sky and hit it way over the wall. Trying to hit it more on a line now, so the swing does look better, but we're going to have to see that really sort of flesh out before we're overly comfortable um, playing Cap Biggio down here in, in the 8-hole. Um, still nowhere near the kind of hitter that his daddy was. Uh, and you can play Kiermaier, for sure. Obviously, mostly in, in there for his defense, but 2,600 is, is pop. And if you need to get different with the Jays stack down here, then you know, you're going to probably have to consider some of these cheaper guys down at the bottom of the lineup, run some wraparound stacks, that sort of stuff. So um, no no Turnbull, almost certainly on the mound for me. Bassett on the other side, yeah, you're going to want to get to him. Gosman was great yesterday, went a full eight innings, even though he gave up three runs. Um, so that's back-to-back -back starts now for Gosman, where he has gone very, very deep. And it's like seven innings and eight innings and 100 pitches both times. It's good numbers and very encouraging for Gosman. Um, we've never really had pitch count concerns with Chris Bassett. Um, going back to his early Oakland days, this guy's just a horse. He goes out there and he, and he chucks uh, pretty much until, they, uh, <laughs> until he's forced to come out of the game, I suppose. Um, so we're not really worried about that necessarily. And at 8,200, the matchup I think here is too good. Where we're going to struggle a little bit with Bassett is, at least compared to Gosman, the strikeout stuff has dropped off a cliff in the last two and three seasons for Bassett. It used to be in the 25-26 range, pretty much against both sides of the plate. Not really the case anymore against righties. Those numbers have, have fallen off um, quite precipitously. Now, still not in the way of suppression and, and production allowed, I suppose, Still just a 100 ISO and a 221 average with a 266 Woba against righties, but just a 20% strikeout rate. So about, you know, two and, and three ticks below league average, two same-handed hitters, which is kind of worrisome. And it's really due to the lack of good breaking stuff. Curveball is okay, um, but the slider is really kind of the, the wipeout whiff pitch that righties can use against righties. And his is you know, pretty... Uh, Pretty marginal, to say the least. So relying on ground balls to keep him out of trouble. Still throwing the sinker as most of his arsenal here. Good value there, and is mixed in the cutter, which has really kind of depressed the strikeout rate over the last couple of seasons, and increased the contact rate, right? So it's not whiffs, because he doesn't throw all that hard, just 93, 95. Tops at 95, mostly. Sits about 92. Um... But pitches to a, a good bit more contact in the last couple of seasons. Full 79% here. So that's how we really want to attack Detroit. I mean, you can attack Detroit with everybody because they're to strike out um, when they're hitting off a tee. But in the early going here, for example, 295 PAs against righties, 25% K rate once again. No power, can't get on base, um, hitting way too many ground balls, buck 60 ground ball to fly ball as a team right now. WRC plus of just 61. So... Small sample there, but, I mean, <laughs> those numbers aren't going to correct uh, in a positive direction all too much over the course of a year. That said, Bassett's really not going to throw it, brought, throw it by them all too regularly, at least some of the righties. So you might have a little bit of upside here for Torque, for example, or a Javi Baez, who has been awful to start the year. A um, little bit of upside in terms of contact, raw contact, for those couple of guys. Through the lefties, though, we probably want to stay away because they're going to strike out a lot, so there's going to be some variance. Um, so I suppose we don't necessarily want to stay away. You could take some some short pieces like a Kerry Carpenter, Riley Green, uh, against righties because Bassett still will give up you know, a buck 95 ISO to the left side, 1.7 homers per nine. So it's not totally out of question that Bassett can get hit around a little bit here. Um, We've seen in the last couple of days that Detroit has been competitive against some pretty good arms in Alec Manoa and, and Kevin Gosman. So it's very reasonable on a short slate if you want to go take some Tigers pieces. Certainly if you're building multiple teams, they're out of, I think, 
probably out of the question on you know in single entry three max type of stuff. You can get to them in twenty max. Um, you could even play a one off Riley Green or one off Kerry Carpenter or something. Somebody with pop against Chris Bassett on a single entry team. It's not totally crazy. Once again, it's a five game slate. You can do whatever you want. So, um, but in most scenarios, you're just going to lock in Bassett at 8,200. Uh, 37% ownership right now is probably too low, I would say. But uh, one of the better plays and certainly the best value adjusted play on the day is Chris Bassett. Okay, Pittsburgh and St. Louis. Um, you're going to see Chalk here again on the Cardinals. Early runs have them as the most popular stack of the day. And it's probably, I mean, it's understandable, I, I think. Um, Vince Velasquez coming in for the Pirates, and this is kind of like, a, this is who Vince Velasquez is. He's got a decent four-seamer, a little bit of whiff stuff on that particular pitch, but everything else that he throws is, uh, you know, leaves quite a bit on the table. Aggregate 20% strikeout, 21% strikeout rate, uh, just 18% to the right side, however, so he's very vulnerable to same-handed hitters. 24% K rate to the lefties, so... Um, vulnerable a bit in power there, 170 ISO to the left side, but has a bit more whiff stuff there. So when we want to attack Velasquez, I mean, he's, he gives up power to both sides of the plate. With it, you know, if we just raw average these two numbers, you're looking at about buck 85, um, buck 90 ISO to both sides. So we can attack him with pretty much anybody, and that's why we're seeing so much ownership of the Cardinals so far. Um, they had a pretty disappointing series in terms of DFS scores. Still won tournaments in back-to-back -back days for you uh, getting to the Cardinals because some of the guys, you know, like uh, in particular like a, a Nolan Gorman who came in and, and hit dingers in the late innings for you. Goldschmidt had a pretty fine series. Aaron Nato was okay. But disappointing from guys like Brendan Donovan, uh, Alec Burleson, um, Tyler O'Neill had an okay day, I believe, yesterday, but uh, nothing in the way of like a Jordan Walker or certainly Wilson Contreras. He's been just an absolute paperweight uh, in the middle of their lineup here, so they probably need to give him a day off, let him clear his head here. Uh, he looks awful at the plate. Plate discipline's terrible. So um, something to consider, as we talked about with Hot Streaks and Matt Chapman, um, Cold streaks also exist, and when guys are not seeing the baseball and they're not comfortable at the plate, paying uh, – when they're not free, <laughs> um, it, it makes it very hard to play them. And Wilson Contreras is definitely in that category right now, very, very cold at the plate. So you can get different, and he's at 25% ownership right now. So you want to fade him, I you're not going to get an argument from me. Um, they probably would have scored, I don't know, another – 10 or 12 runs in that series in Coors had he not been so bad. So that said, you can still attack Velasquez. Uh, go after him with righties. Go after him with lefties. Um, attack him however you'd like. This is perfectly fine. He just doesn't have enough. He's another one of these guys that I don't think we're going to be able to get to, even if you're building a lot of teams. Um, 6,400, I'm just not interested, even at very low ownership. Um, can he pop for 14 points? Yeah, sure. We've seen that the Cardinals, when they go cold, they can go cold. Um, but overall, I think uh, something we probably want to avoid with Vince Velasquez. Uh, on the other side, Jordan Montgomery on their mound. Lefty for the Birds. 8500 is fine price. Kind of a suspiciously uh, bad matchup here, at least in the early going against lefties. Sh very short sample, of course. Um, ages 80 PAs, but not striking out at the super alarming clip are the Pirates that they were like last season, for example, when we could attack them pretty much at will. 22.5% um, K rate against lefties so far. Very short sample. So we'll see how that fleshes out here today. But overall, they've got some righties that they can throw into the list. Um, certainly Brian Reynolds hits from both sides. McCutcheon has always had very good numbers, certainly over the last couple of years. More of a platoon hitter anymore is Kutch, but still hits lefties. Perfectly well. Carlos Santana doesn't strike out at all. Oh. And Cabrian Hayes, he, he will strike out, but um, plenty of power to get to Jordan Montgomery here. Connor Joe doesn't strike out. So they can platoon here over here from the right side. 
and that could make it a little bit more difficult on Jordan Montgomery. Only a 20% strikeout rate for him against right-handers. Now, just a 160 ISO and a 300 Woba, those numbers are fine, but definitely some contact vulnerability here to the right side. Not in terms of hard contact necessarily. 29% is not nothing, but uh, it's not like worrisome elevated levels or anything like that 1.1 homers per nine so he's fine 8500 and popped ownership here really 37 40 percent um should he be in you know four of every 10 teams you build tonight yeah probably i think the the ownership value is uh, the ownership number rather i don't think there's a whole lot of value to squeeze out of this in either direction um you probably want to get to the field with montgomery here today against an overall pretty weak lineup but i mean if i had to if i had to choose i'd probably come in underweight to be honest um price tag is fine and we've seen that he can pop really hard in good matchups but i'm not sure that the pirates here are all that great a matchup so we might see a little bit of susceptibility here but once again, like you can attack with him for sure um pirates are going to go cold Definitely, and of course with the loss of um, O'Neill Cruz at the top of the lineup, even though he, you don't want to touch him against lefties, and you, you don't want to play any lefties against Jordan Montgomery. He's elite, 205 average, 215 Woba, 063 ISO with a 34% K rate. Um, it's still going to be a little bit difficult for the Pirates to uh, turn over the top of the lineup here missing O'Neill Cruz, so uh, because he's a, still a very good young hitter, even though he does strike out at a very alarming rate against left-handers. So you can play um, a lot of Jordan Montgomery if you'd like. You can play a lot of Cardinals if you'd like. But once again, on short slates, you're going to have to. We've seen it in the last couple of days. Uh, you're going to have to try and get different in tournaments with them because they're very, very popular, and at north of 25 or 20% 20 ownership in aggregate, once again, uh, you're gonna have to find a way to uh, to insert some um, some contrarian pieces to your builds. So uh, just keep that stuff in mind. But good plays nonetheless, pretty much uh, all the way around here for the Cardinals. Really not much in the way. Uh, certainly not for Vince Velasquez. But you can play some of these righties if you want. Maybe in short stacks, like a. Uh, I'm not sure I want to go out of my way to play a Connor Joe, but he doesn't strike out. He's 3400. If you land on him in the outfield, it's fine. Brian Hayes, plenty of pop, 37. This is probably my favorite play, uh, price adjusted. Um, 6000 for Brian Reynolds, I probably not, right? Um, so probably Cabrian Hayes, the, the favorite play over here at 37. But um, overall, not too excited about the Pittsburgh offense. All right, going a little bit long here, I think. Um, but let's get into... The last game here, Milwaukee and San Diego. Some potentially attackable arms on the mound here. Bryce Wilson mentioned he's probably just going to open. Just a bullpen arm. Not stretched out at all. And through three days ago. Uh, through a couple innings there. So at most you'll get two to three innings out of him. He is kind of a long guy for them. Uh, but he's not going to go any, any deeper than that. Uh, so he at certainly at 8,000, you cannot play him. Um, not really sure what they're going to do. Probably just piece together uh, a bullpen day for the Brewers. So do you want to attack that? Generally, we don't like stacking teams in bullpen games, right? It's it's a little bit harder. You're sacrificing a little bit of value when when teams are just, like, rotating in reliever after reliever against hitters. Um, there's a little bit more the manager has to has to do with uh, controlling game flow and things like that. And Craig Council over here is a pretty good manager. So he can match up and he can attack some matchups because Bryce Wilson actually has been eating some innings for them on the, in, in sort of the, the latter halves of games here. So their bullpen overall is mostly pretty rested and as far as I know, pretty much everybody should be available today. So that does kind of make it difficult sometimes when we're just going after bullpen arms. Um, however, Bryce Wilson, he's not going to, uh, like, we don't want to shy away from, 
you know, playing guys against him. That's, you know, 289 average to lefties, 373 Woba, 218 ISO, 17.5% K rate. Not going to throw it by them. And the Padres, even though they are striking out at a kind of alarming rate so far, 300 PAs early here in the season against righties, 25, 26% nearly uh, strikeouts. So a little alarming there, but Bryce Wilson, he's, he's not going to throw it by them. Uh, but maybe some some depressed upside in aggregate if we are fully stacking the Padres here and targeting a bullpen game. Um, because, like I said, they can match up pretty well and dictate a lot of matchups when they choose. Um, but we can certainly go after him with righties as well. Buck 68 ISO, 327 Woba, and a 271 average allowed. So these are all pretty elevated numbers for sure, and definitely for a guy coming out of the bullpen. Um, so we can attack him, and feel free to get to some Padres. They're going to be kind of off the board as well. Certainly some of the guys on a shorter slate like a Juan Soto, uh, even a Xander or Machado. Xander, mostly because of positional eligibility. Um, definitely one of the better hitters at shortstop in general. So he always kind of sees a little bit elevated ownership and most certainly on shorter slates. Uh, Machado, of course, as well. So you're going to see some numbers on those guys, but everybody else for the Padres, you could sprinkle some of these guys in if you want to get to stacks and just take shots against Brewers. It's fine um, because Bryce Wilson, he may not be able to go a full two to three innings here because of these contact numbers. You know, the, the Padres could very well get to him right off the bat. Juan Soto looks like he's starting to heat up a little bit. Um, 5,600 is a pretty pretty good price tag for him here. And if he were hitting a lot better to start the season, you'd probably see, I don't know, 20 to 25% ownership on him on a five-game slate in most scenarios. So you might be able to squeeze a little bit of value out of just the 15% we're showing on him right now. So Possible, definitely, to get to the Padres if you'd like in stacks. Uh, no Bryce Wilson, surely. Nick Martinez on the mound for the Pods, 7,400. This is also a playable tournament piece. He has a little bit of upside at the price tag. Um, I don't think there's a ton of value that we could necessarily squeeze out of this. The Brewers are actually going to be one of your more popular stacks today, attacking Martinez. 18% ownership does seem a little bit high. Uh, I'm not sure I want to have him in one in every five teams. Um, so I'd probably come in underweight on this as well. Median projection does look about accurate. So I think there might be a little bit of a discrepancy here in the projection price tag and the ownership. Um, seem, something seems a, a little bit fishy here in the early runs. So those throw strikes early in the count, not so much later in the count because he's got a 9.5% and 10% walk rate. Not a lot of strikeout stuff. So he's pitching to contact when he's throwing strikes. 75% um, overall contact rate, that's a pretty good number. Good hard contact hard contact numbers allowed, that's fine. Biggest vulnerability is to the left side of the plate. 221 average, not so much there. 314 Woba, not so much there. But an 11% walk rate to lefties and a 176 ISO. He does have a really good changeup, and that neutralizes a lot of the power that he would otherwise give up to the left side, but he's still translating to a, a 1.7 homers per nine to lefties. So, and this is over a relatively large sample, 53 and a third over the last season plus. So certainly some vulnerability, and that's why we're seeing a, a, some healthy ownership on the Brewers so far. They can obviously platoon from the left side with the best of them. And if you want a little bit of a, a late night hammer, um, and you want to get off of some of the Toronto and the and the St. Louis, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yelich still at 4,800 uh, uh, price tag. I just do not like. He's not the Yelich. The, he's not MVP Yelich anymore. And um, till this price tag comes down, or they move him down in the freaking lineup, or both, hopefully, um, he, I, he, he's very difficult to play. That said, Martinez is still going. He's going to run into a ball eventually, uh, and occasionally. Martinez, you can still. Take, you can still target with some lefties. Wink at 32. He's been dealing with um, a bit of a cold, I think. 3,200, though, if he's in the two holes, is a really good play. Probably see some elevated ownership on him if he's in the list. Uh, Willie, you can play at 52 for sure. Rowdy, definitely at 32. Uh, also, uh, Garrett Mitchell, plenty of pop. Bryce Terang, plenty of pop. So you can get to Nick Martinez with some lefties here. That's why we're seeing some, some ownership on them. But if you want a full stack, 
Don't forget about Willie. He's got plenty of – his numbers are, are perfectly fine uh, against righties as well. You can throw in uh, William Contreras behind the plate and, and play him instead of his brother at about, I don't know, 20% of the ownership. Um, you can play Brian Anderson as well. So you can play some of the righties too if you want to get to – uh, some of the brewers and, and get a little contrarian with it. Definitely if you're building multiple teams, this is a viable construction build down here. Um, but you can play a little bit of Nick Martinez also at 7,400. Like I said, he's a, he's a fine tournament play. I'd probably building multiple teams come in underweight, but he's an okay tournament play because the brewers, they're still going to strike out 24% here in the early going and a hundred or excuse me, 350 PAs against righties. Certainly a lot of pop, their walk rate is coming down. It's down to 12% now, but uh, probably a little bit of, of walk upside um, due to the full 10% walk rate from Martinez here. So you can get to the Brewers. I think it's perfectly respectable and, and a viable build on today's slate. So we did see that uh, – I'm not going to switch it in the sheet here, but we did see that the – looks like the lineups are out for everybody here on the early slate. Uh, Oakland leading off is Terry Ruiz. He's cheap. One of the better value plays of the day, hitting from the right side. Uh, this is fine if you want to get to that. Ramon Laureano in the two. He'll be pretty popular at 41. Um, still probably their best raw hitter, even though he's got some serious holes. Um, Brent Rooker hit a bomb yesterday. Got them off to a good start. Um, this is okay. And I, I think it's okay if, if you want to attack Cole Irvin. Uh, Jesus Aguilar, of course, in the four-hole, 3,100. Very good prices over here overall on Oakland. Um, and on a two-gamer, if you want to stack against Irv and play the other side of the game, or play both sides here, uh, that's, I think that's fine. Um, but you're once again going to have to get different with some of these guys down here at the bottom of the lineup. Ledmus Diaz has fine numbers against lefties. Kevin Smith, uh, Carlos Perez, eh, probably not. Shea's got plenty of pop, 31 behind the plate. It's fine. Um, so we do see that uh, Anthony Santander is out of the lineup. You got Gunner up here in the four. He's your chalk third base slash shortstop today. Um, but pretty much everybody from Baltimore, including Taron Vavra, he might not get played all that much. You'll probably see a good 12% ownership on, on him, I would guess. Um, but he's got multi-position eligibility, eligibility, and he's the stone min. They did just call up this morning Ryan O'Hearn. He has pop, uh, but keep in mind that whenever you play Ryan O'Hearn, you're st a stone lock for a zero. The guy is probably the most frustrating hitter in baseball. Um, I mean, he, he's super tilting to play, but plenty of upside if he can run into a ball. Uh, Georgie Mateo, we've talked about. He's got a lot of speed. If he can get on base, he can turn the lineup, lineup over here uh, pretty good. So um, y you need to get contrarian with the, with the O's. Uh, Verdugo is leading off against Springs, so it looks like Boston is trying to play a little bit of that reverse split narrative here. Uh, Ref Snyder is not going to strike out against lefties. Good numbers, 2,500 here in the three-hole. That's an interesting play. You can play Casas as well. If you want to full-stack Boston and hope for a mega outlier performance against Springs, that's the easiest way to differentiate yourself from the field today because Springs is going to be, like I said, 80 85% owned uh, in pretty much every tournament you play. Um, outside of that, not too crazy about everything they've got going on down here. Reese McGuire, I, I, he kind of stinks, even though he hits from the left side. Um, I like the price tag. Uh, maybe I don't. He, he may even be overpriced, 2700 here. Um, and certainly you can play Tampa. You can play everybody. Luke Rayleigh in the five here at 3600 probably your best price adjusted play. But Harold's got some good pop from the right side at 33 Taylor Wall's in here, um, as opposed to uh, Isak Paredes. Um, they're platooning those two a little bit. 2,400, you can get to him. Josh Lowe has some pop. 4,000, not wild about this. That's really going to keep his ownership down. So if you need to get different, consider some overpriced guys down at the bottom of these lineups on these short two gamers. Uh, so that'll do it for today and the main slate, and I suppose the early slate as well. Uh, we will have projection updates pushed to the site and... Um, you know, good luck to everybody, and we'll be back tomorrow for a full 12-gamer on Friday evening. Good luck.